So Lindsay Walsh is an American artist, designer, writer, researcher, and creative producer based in Berlin. She is currently in Russia. She holds a bachelor's in uh, individualized studies from New York University and a master's in biological arts with distinction from Symbiotic A Center of Excellence in Biological Arts at the University of Western Australia. Uh, she's fascinated by the creatures emerging from the spaces in between and crossing over the imaginary, the becoming and reality. Her work explores the instability surrounding the cultural and social aspects of disease, identity, the body, visibility, death, human and non-human relationships, and speculative narratives on the future. She's a social media manager and a creative producer for the Dutch nonprofit arts organization called Ambo Collective. And she's also in a queer artistic collaboration called Crowless, alongside with another artist and writer, Jess Cockrell. Uh, uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, she exhibited internationally and published a lot of work in lots of famous magazines so these being said over to you Lindsay <laughs> welcome yeah. we're happy to have you here no yeah, thank you thank you for having me um, it's a pleasure let me start sharing my screen uh, again, full screen um yeah so I'm Lindsay um I uh do lots of different kinds of art um i used to categorize myself kind of more in the realm of bio art but i also do a lot of digital art and new media art as well um and a lot of my art tends to focus on these intersections between science and society and culture um which started really from my undergrad uh days at nyu um uh where i was really trying to explore different ways that the world around me made sense and how other people historically have made sense of the world through both science and art and um yeah this has really just taken me on this sort of like wonderful journey in my artistic practice uh which i will share with you now um so oftentimes i will be working in the lab which is not the traditional studio space that i think most people associate for an artist um this is me uh working in the my uh the stem cell biology lab that i used to work in in australia at symbiotica um and because i end up working in these very unusual spaces i also end up working with very unusual materials as well quite often um and kind of where my artistic journey started was uh, in my undergrad, uh, I was working with uh, whales um, and whale skulls, and I was really trying to think of uh, ways to use artistic critique and theory to analyze the morphology of whale skulls. And if I use sort of different artistic applications, could this change the ways that we read knowledge about these sort of creatures from science? Um, I picked uh, it was whales, dolphins, and porpoises, and I picked these like types of animals in particular because uh, in zoology, these organisms really are kind of outliers in terms of what we know about them and their morphology. They don't make any sense at all. Um, they're quite strange, and I thought since current science has a difficult time accounting for them, could art account for them instead? And could art explain things about them that science could it by reorganizing these narratives? And the outcome of this project was a series of four animations. There are two here. Um, and I believe the ones that are here, the one to the uh, left hand side of the screen is called Pulse. And it's showing um, different sort of spots on the skull of a dolphin uh, that are um, uh, used for echolocation. So about how the form kind of goes beyond its structural capacity and has this sort of uh, non-visual uh, space that inhabits as well. And the one to the right is called the horizontality and it's showing um, these sutures in a harbor porpoise. So the kind of spaces in between of development uh, that really uh, help both form and deform uh, the porpoise's skull. Um, and a lot of this sort of work was based on the text of Ivelaine's Boys and Rosalind Krauss, as well as um, 
George Bataille, who I think I've butchered his first name because uh, French and I'm really bad at pronouncing French names. Um, but from there, I started working with stem cells in uh, Perth, Western Australia at Symbiotica Center of Excellence in Biological Arts in about 2017. And I did a lot of work kind of trying to figure out different artistic explorations with stem cells. I thought they were very fascinating, especially how in um, society and culture, they're really advertised as sort of this promising potential of could cure anything and um, this sort of surplus of life as Melinda Cooper, uh, cultural researcher Melinda Cooper says in her book. Um, and uh, this one in particular, I was working with neural stem cells here and trying to figure out different ways to create 3D sculptures and structures with them microscopically. Um, and this is one of the, the outcomes of this, but I was also really interested in the history of stem cells as well, because uh, stem cells kind of have this really uh, sort of secretive monstrous history to them, um, which led to my next project. Uh, that I was featured in the worm exhibition with Ram Laman, um, which is Return of the Teratoma. And uh, so in sort of brief history of stem cells, um, uh, a scientist named Dr. Leroy Stevens was the first person to characterize them, I believe in like the 70s, I want to say. Um, and he found stem cells while studying uh, these sort of types of tumors called teratomas in uh, mice. Um, and a teratoma is a tumor that uh, is typically associated with uh, growing teeth and hair. And if you Google it, you'll get all these horrific images of crazy tumors that you could possibly grow. Um, but I thought it was really interesting how even till today, stem cells sort of have this material potential where they can become either any cell in the human body, like we know that they've been advertised to us to be, as well as cancer. But yet we don't really talk about this cancerous aspect of stem cells for many different reasons involving the involvement of neoliberal capitalism and these clinical values in science. And so I was wondering, like the teratoma seems to continually haunt stem cell biology as this looming figure and what that really means and how could that be contextualized artistically. And the result of that was this sort of quirky horror movie I made uh, that features a teratoma that I grew um, from embryonic stem cells that were uh, developed to be a type of organoid, which is a piece of stem cell technology. Uh, this one in particular was a retinal organoid. And so these um, little uh, black dots right there, I think is my mouse is pointing to something, um, to the right-hand side in the poster. Uh, those are actual retinas of the eye. Uh, so this creature has little eyes if you wanna um, call them, but I also ended up growing teeth for them as well. And I spent a long time trying to figure out how to make teeth from stem cells uh, with 3D printing and various other methods and came up with a completely different result. Um, and these teeth were adhered to the teratoma uh, to get the famous sort of teratoma with teeth and hair thing. Um, I didn't end up managing to grow hair for them, unfortunately, but the, the organoid itself came with a these wonderful little like bubbly bits, which um, are currently hypothesized to be lung tissue, uh, which was really fun. And so I spent uh, every other day in the lab feeding this little creature uh, and taking care of it for not my entire master's thesis. And uh, it was wonderful then that this creature then got to kind of live on. Um, it has now passed away because uh, it has really expensive food and I couldn't manage to keep feeding it for forever, unfortunately. Um, but it gets to kind of live on in this horror movie where it um, basically, uh, it was made in collaboration with my very good friend, Mark De Pasquale, who uh, is a filmmaker in New York City. And um, in the film, the teratoma haunts Mark and other places in New York City, uh, kind of in the style of found footage. And uh, as you're watching it, the creature will come into full view and then the screen will cut to just static. Um, and so really I designed this artwork for people to sit in the room and feel like they are security guard looking for monsters and where to find them and kind of um, uh, take that sort of practice. One of the screens in the film is actually quite really hard to find the monster. I think only a couple of people have been able to do it from when I've been asking them. Um, but here in the top right, we have it coming out 
uh, haunting poor Mark about to get him. And then uh, to the to the right hand side, we have it walking down the street in Brooklyn. Um, the bottom right hand corner, it's in a, a film closet. Uh, and then to the bottom left, it's a uh, haunting up a staircase with its wonderful, creepy little shadow. Um, and this movie was part of a much larger project that I was connecting to about stem cell potential and its materiality um, with sort of these 3D sculptures that I was making with stem cells, as I kind of briefly mentioned before with the neural stem cells, I ended up uh, kind of in the sort of exhibition stage of the work, switching to working with mesenchymal stem cells. And in the gallery, I used uh, rat mesenchymal stem cells. So mesenchymal stem cells come from bone marrow. Um, and I ended up developing this performance called The Hanging Drop, where I would suspend stem cells in uh, little droplets of nutrient medium, which is the kind of liquid food that cells eat. Um, and over time, they would end up making these really beautiful sculptures. Uh, it was like a 72 hour span of time. And so people could come to the gallery and see how these sculptures would be made over time and how they would change. But the problem that happens when you entrap stem cells in these sort of little um, bubbles is that, uh, especially in the gallery, was that I couldn't take them out. And so they would eventually eat all of the nutrients in these bubbles and uh, they would start to die. So the audience could come and watch the cells also fall apart and these sculptures sort of dissolve as well as they died. Um, which brought in all sorts of fun ethical questions about how could I as an artist do this? Was I being cruel? Um, how do we empathize with these sort of un, unhuman, like non-human, like entities? Um, I got a lot of people trying to manslay stem cells to me and uh, asking if these came from aborted fetuses, which was also interesting as an artist to experience. Um, and the whole exhibition really was framing this sort of emerging potential of uh, what can come from stem cells? And are we really prepared to sort of deal with these things, both the good and the bad? And um, how, do we, how do we treat these sort of unlike, unlikely and sort of unfamiliar and strange creatures that are coming from this sort of uh, scientific potential? Um, and uh, after that, I ended up moving to Germany and uh, I got a wonderful position at Humboldt University of Berlin, um, working in the Department of Experimental Biophysics, uh, where I was uh, working with, with genetically modified algae. Um, and this was a kind of algae called Chlamydomonas reinhardi. And they are, uh, you would probably know them if you've ever seen pond scum or like a green film on a lake. You probably didn't give them much thought ever. They're, they're very not remarkable normally, um, but these organisms are model organisms in science. And it's actually the foundation of this field of optogenetics, which is this um, sort of study about how we can use certain proteins uh, to be engineered into cells, uh, for example, in our brain to sort of treat things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's with light. Um, so you can shine light on these sort of, um, these light sensitive gated ion channels and they'll open up and allow cells to exhibit certain behaviors. Uh, in the cases of these algae, they will move their flagella and swim in different directions, which is really nice. And so this project was really exploring uh, three different types of works, but I'm only gonna talk about one in the scope of this talk, uh, but I was going through performance ways and speculative design as well as object making. And um, the kind of, one of my major inspirations for this, for this was um, my love of Dance Dance Revolution as a child of the, the late 90s, early 2000s in the US. Um, and I kind of offhandedly made a joke to my mother that I wanted to have dance battles with the algae because they responded to light. And I ended up running with that joke um, uh, because that's <laughs> apparently the kind of artist that I am. Um, and so I ended up, programming and designing sort of these different experimental uh, setups to have uh, the algae be exposed to different light waves. And I picked four different strains of algae that had different genetic modifications. And I thought that Dance Dance Revolution also made this really beautiful sort of poetic critique about human desires and control when it comes to genetically modifying other organisms. 
can we really control these other organisms' wills? Like how much control do we have? Also, is it selfish? Is it ethical to control other organisms in this way? When it comes to discussions about like controlling algae, for example, um, they wanna do this not only to study things for human bodies, but also to be able to produce more efficient biofuels from algae and other sort of pharmaceutical based products and things like that. So should we really be exploiting these like tiny, tiny, tiny organisms um, that we don't give much thought to in these sort of very uh, extreme ways like through genetic modification? And also what does that control even mean? And so these four different strains of algae had different responses to light based on their modifications or they were supposed to. Um, I'm not sure if they did exactly that. Um, but the idea was that the light would then trigger these sort of responses from them and they would either be good at dancing these dance battles or bad at dancing these dances that I made. And I worked with um, some wonderful sound designers, Bailey Keo and Santiago Borelli, um, to come up with some sort of fun techno y <laughs> dance dance revolution style music, um, along with also my scientific collaborators, Olga Badakova and uh, Dr. Peter Hegeman. Um, and we did these different setups then in the lab um, with the algae. And uh, from that, we recorded them using this uh, really complicated microscopic camera, along with some very uh, difficult programming software that was not really made to record minute long dance battles for algae. Um, we kind of had to hack the software. It was made for doing biophysics experiments and not algae dancing. Um, and from that, uh, my collaborator, Alex Liu, who's a wonderful animator, uh, we ended up creating sort of this, uh, these film installations, which are still in its final post-production stages uh, for the algae, where they're competing in dance battles against each other to see who can follow my choreography the best. And the kind of uh, funny aesthetic of disappointment that comes out of this is that algae are not very good at dancing at all in response to like choreography. Um, this really gets into sort of ideas of microperformance uh, that uh, Jens Hauser uh, has put out um, where really I have to, when looking at microscopic organisms and the, sort of these microscopic time scales and things like that, they're so far different than human time scales and human sort of scales of any thing that uh, you have to sort of position yourself as algae. And even though I tried my hardest to like study algae and think about well, if this is how the algae time scale works, how can I put choreography with that? It, it still isn't good enough. I don't think I truly can get in the head space of algae to truly understand their behavior or they might just really be bad dancers, I'm not sure. Um, but it was a wonderful, funny experience and uh, the algae ended up controlling my life a lot more than I think I controlled theirs with how often I had to feed them and take care of them and get rid of their waste and things like that. Um, and after that, uh, the pandemic hit, which was uh, both kind of a awful thing for the world itself, but also very inspiring in terms of the fact that I work with biological materials and I'm often thinking about things as, with biosecurity. And so I was kind of wondering now that everyone has these sort of questions on their minds, how do people think about the future of our biosecurity and what sort of biosecurity threats do they even know about or could know about in their own country? And how does each country differ between each other about how they would sort of regulate them? I think when the pandemic first hit, we were all kind of seeing how each country was responding differently in all my international Zooms. They were like, what's happening in your country? And like, what's going on there? And how's the government handling that? And so I kind of wondered what people thought about this as well as are there ways that performance and sort of these enacting out these sort of playscapes can return some sense of autonomy to people about these sort of decision making processes which really feel oftentimes out of their hands. Um, and that's where the Department of Speculative Biosecurity and Biosurveillance came up, um, which I had the wonderful privilege of uh, having the first session of it uh, in Russia in St. Petersburg at ITMO University's Art and Science Center. Um, these two posters are from the first performance. The one uh, to the right hand side says, uh, do you trust your chickens? Um, and it's uh, <laughs> speaking about blockchain chicken ideas um, and chicken farming. And the one to the left says, uh, no mask means death. 
Um, and so the whole sort of performance uh, was based on research that I had done about how Russian, different Russian biosecurity threats that uh, are currently relevant to the time and um, how these would potentially impact Russian culture and society. And these sort of biosecurity questions were um, framed as being given by an AI who had traveled um, back in time from the future um, uh, and was asking people for help in order to save the future of humanity, that something was going to go wrong in the future. And if we don't start thinking about these issues now and getting this knowledge and information into this, uh, this AI's uh, data banks now that something was gonna go wrong later. And so there was this big funding opportunity in the future to try to do these temporal ventures to educate people of the past and get their thoughts and ideas to save the future. And so um, the AI was named uh, IO for standing uh, for information's operator. And she would sort of frame the different problems that were arising and ask people to then give their feedback and then based off their feedback, new sort of scenarios would arise. Um, and it was really interesting to kind of see people interacting with the work. I'm actually about to do this performance again in um, a Biennale in the Ural Mountains uh, here in Russia. Um, so that will be also interesting to see what happens now that I feel like the more the time that's passed with the pandemic, uh, people's responses really change, whether or not they care so much about this. Um, the project itself didn't just feature on sort of like pandemic based questions It also asked about uh, things like um, nuclear waste, how people feel about that. And also things like uh, agricultural issues and industrial farming, a uh, big problem that uh, threatens actually a lot of the world that people don't talk about is uh, African swine fever infecting our pig populations and Russia has an interesting and wonderful sort of complicated history with that. Um, uh, yeah, and it was sort of looking at these different uh, features in like Russian society that have been uh, taught to address these sort of issues. It seems that uh, in Russia, there are certain organizations that exist that don't exist in other places of the world to address biosecurity threats. So that was quite interesting for me to find out in my research as well. And so trying to position these and get people's feedback it was really nice. And I hope that eventually this project will leave Russia to come to another country. And then I'll be able to sort of get other people's feedback and be able to research more about that country as well. Um, additionally, during the pandemic, uh, kind of this time of making digital art, I ended up collaborating with my very good friend, Jess Cockerell, who is a wonderful artist and writer based in uh, NARM or what people know as Melbourne, Australia. Um, and we ended up forming Crawlers. Uh, this was actually a uh, long time coming since we both seemed to like the same sort of creepy, weird things. And um, we, I reached out to Jess really wanting to work on something more ecological based. And uh, Jess was very open and down to, to do this. And so Crawlers kind of emerged from this sort of um, undergrowth of different ideas. And uh, me and Jess both frame it as that we are Symbionts and our feral collaboration. And we are, uh, our crawlers itself is sort of a riding tangled cluster of biological science, visual art, horror cinema, wild technology, new age mythology, and a morbid fascination with the afterlife. Um, and we both sort of take our practice uh, based on like our, our queer identity, as well as uh, working with disability and uh, non neurotypical narratives as well. Um, to kind of reframe how we can look at ecology and also society and culture and the intersections between the two, or all of them. Um, and our first sort of uh, crawlers event was a, a project that debuted at the Aerobaros Festival, uh, which was an online festival, but I think taking sort of physical, which centered in the Czech Republic. Um, and uh, we ended up crafting a series of workshops called A Practical Guide to Ecomancy in the Digital Age, um, which was exploring how we could do different forms of narrative making, uh, combining both magic and science, which I think people oftentimes feel like are in opposition. Um, but for Jess and I, these, these actually seem to go hand in hand a lot more than uh, other people, I guess, would like to think. 
Um, and we wanted to do this because the theme of Ouroboros was designing in troubled times. And when we were thinking about troubled times in the future, how can we re rely on more of these holistic and sort of magical and taboo practices and combine it with science to maybe, I don't know, divine some sort of vision of a future if possible, or gain some sort of knowledge about the world around us and our non-human symbionts uh, as well that could, that could give some hope, I guess. <laughs> Um, the image in this uh, slide here is from our workshop called Consuming the Mother, which we uh, were looking at um, kind of how we could do combine uh, tea leaf reading with uh, kombucha making and talking about um, basically how queer identity and notions of gender identity and sexuality are very different when you look at how human bodies are not just made up of human cells but also non-human cells and so we are also the sum of all of the identities of all the organisms inside of us and not just our human one um, and we were really positioning this within the realm of um, uh, my kind of cultural inheritance of uh, Kabbalah uh, being raised Jewish and it was uh, really interesting to kind of for me to reflect on something that I did not like growing up at all and kind of position it back into like a more of a magical and queer system, uh, which I kind of more identify with um, as well. And uh, people got to learn how to make kombucha, which was great. That's always good fun. Um, the next workshop we did um, is one that we're kind of working on right now. We have uh, working on to further develop right now, but we, uh, it was called Ecological Divination. And basically, uh, Justin and I made our uh, own tarot deck. Um, and we kind of reconfigured what tarot meant for us and how we read tarot. And uh, during sort of the tarot readings, um, both Justin and I and the participant would kind of work together to kind of uh, figure out more about this mysterious tarot deck that we've kind of unearthed from the crawler's lore. Um, and it was a really wonderful project because behind the scenes, Jess and I had made all of the cards a bit separately and we hadn't talked to each other at all about what was going to be, we did like a brief outline of like, this needs to be here and this needs to be there, but we didn't really talk about the specifics about what each card had to like look like or be like. And uh, we ended up creating a deck that like really fits well together and ended up actually every person who came to one of our readings was like, how did you guys make this work? It's so magical, like this is so accurate. And we were like, oh, we don't, we don't know. We kind of just did it. Um, and it was, it's been really wonderful. And this deck is, it's really something special for us. And so we're hoping to kind of uh, put it into future applications of things that can be more easily distributed to like different festivals and galleries and things like that. Um, and the last workshop we did uh, was the one about uh, which we're about to launch an open call for as well um, with the wrong Biennale, which is an online digital Biennale, um, but it was our Portals to Summon Web Chaos uh, workshop. Um, and Jess has a very deep fascination with making portals, one that I've kind of like happily jumped into because it's really so enthralling. Um, and these are two portals that are featured on our Instagram as well as on our website um, uh, that Jess has sort of created for us. And um, uh, these portals and portal making, we have an entire instructional manual about how to make a portal using uh, chaos magic and contagion magic to really sort of uh, imbue not only like your, your sense of yourself, but also your surroundings and your involvement in your own sort of ecology and environment. Um, and we did it to sort of, cause we don't see the technological and the internet as being separate from the environment at all. We really aren't fans of these ideas that the technological is something other than the natural. Um, we sort of see them as interconnected and that portals are these wonderful ways to sort of uh, literally kind of break down those barriers and create a hole to pass through each of them. And so during the workshop, we asked, um, everyone who participated, if they could make a portal and upload it to our website as well. And each portal on our website ends up, um, uh, which we today have like our, you can make your own portal right now. We have a, a little sort of PDF guide about how to get started with all the instructions. And then you can charge your portal and submit it to us. 
and we'll feature it on our website and I will also then code it so that it goes to a random place on the internet as well so that it can summon some of your own web chaos. Um, and this is sort of the work that we're having a pavilion for the wrong Bien wrong Biennale with that we're very excited to announce our open call soon. So um, yeah, we're hoping to get lots of lots of different kinds of portals from all different kinds of people to feature and create as much web chaos as we possibly can on our site. Um, and uh, our portal making kind of has been pushed over into some of our fascination with uh, kind of uh, this queer death narratives, um, which is an emerging sort of discipline looking at death beyond just uh, kind of human death and also beyond just like uh, the, the heteronormative perspective of death. There's lots of different studies within queer death as a whole. We're really interested in sort of the non-human narratives that are present within death, especially within human death, like what happens to our microbiome when we die, I think has been one of the major questions that we've just been consumed by. And so we've created different imagery. This were featured in the queer death scene, um, which was the first publication, a zine publication by the Queer Death Society. Um, and these two images were ones that we were made uh, from, this is, partially one of our very close friends who's friends with both of us is this is part of the reason why they're like I don't want any part of your collaboration you always do weird things with toenails and skin infections and I'm glad you found each other um this is sort of a manifestation of that um and looking at these sort of narratives of like the non-human sort of role in human-based diseases and decay as well and what can we learn from these two opposing narratives when they're shown together and that sort of friction created by the two of them. Um, and lastly, uh, last project I'd like to talk about tonight is partially why I'm here in Russia. <laughs> um, so back in 2020, I wrote an article for Nautilus magazine about um, my genetic diagnostics of having a BRCA1 mutation, which I was diagnosed when I was 18, um, after my mom had had cancer when I was a teenager. Um, and so the article was really exploring the problematic situation in the United States about having uh, one of these genetic mutations. As I explore in the article and uh, have lived through is, um, I have been told by my insurance company, my former insurance company in the United States, um, that I am only covered by my health insurance as long as I'm not sick. The moment I become sick with this potential to get cancer, which, um, stepping back a little bit if you have one of these genetic mutations in your BRCA1 gene or your BRCA2 gene that means you have an abnormally high probability of developing a certain set of diseases um in the case of BRCA1 uh you have a really high chance about 72 percent I think is what the NIH says of developing breast cancer throughout your lifetime as well as you can develop ovarian cancer fallopian tube cancer uh cancer of the lining of your peritoneum, which is like the, the lining between you know, like your rib cage and your lungs and pancreatic cancer. Um, and so my health insurance company has told me that if I do get sick, it, because this is a pre-existing condition now, um, I would no longer be covered, um, but they'll cover all of sort of my preventative health care that I need to have until I do get sick, um, which includes uh, getting yearly mammograms and MRIs and potential having very extreme preventative surgeries, such as a preventative double mastectomy and a preventative hysterectomy, and also doing all sorts of family planning things, such as uh, if I ever wanna have kids, I have to have them before I'm 35, and all sorts of dif difficult life decisions that you have to make a lot earlier than you think you need to make. Um, and it's really upsetting to have to then occupy the space where you're both I'm completely healthy now, and as healthy as I could be, but I'm also treated as if I'm sick, which is really weird. And to be in the space where you're both sick and healthy at the same time, just uh, it really does a number on your sense of identity as well as sort of bodily anxiety, because every sort of uncomfortable thing that happens, it could be cancer. Um, you get to jump to like the worst case conclusion, just like WebMD does. Uh, because you're already put in this position of thinking that you're going to eventually have cancer. Um, and when I 
started moving around the world, um, Australia, as well as Germany, and now I'm in Russia, I've noticed that uh, no country is really equipped to sort of handle these difficult situations about genetic privacy, genetic diagnostics, and what insurance means and what care means for these like long-term preventative sorts of things. Um, the United States being one of the worst, but even some countries that I thought were quite good are also have major problems with it as well. Um, and some countries are completely unknown. Like I just met with uh, um, the European University here studying um, with a bunch of sociologists studying these sorts of things. And it's, in our conversations, it was really unknown if this specific kind of gene and this specific kind of conversations were happening in Russia since uh, the legal framework doesn't really exist and it's quite vague. Um, so this has been really exciting for me to find out from like a artistic research perspective as well. Um, and so this project is a part of a series of three different parts. The first part is taking place at the Art and Science Center at ITMO University in St. Petersburg, Russia, which is why I'm here in Russia now, um, where I'm researching how I can design a wearable device to house my cancer with the eventual goal that I would be able to take care of my cancer and reframe this narrative of waiting around for my cancer to kill me or waiting around to kill it to how can I care for it? How can I reclaim my body and how can I learn about it? Um, and so I'm working with uh, the labs here at my university in order to develop this with uh, right now the cell line HCC1937, which is a BRCA1 positive cancer cell line taken from breast tissue. Um, and then in part two of this, I would like to recreate this device that's happening in a newly commissioned uh, project with the BioArt Society um, in Helsinki, Finland, um, also in partner with, um, as part of their Mother's Becoming exhibition and project, which works also with uh, the Laboratory for Aesthetics and Ecology in Denmark, the Association of a Age and Mental Health in Denmark, and Cultivator Art Lab Genesis. Um, and for Mother Becoming, really looking at that is what are alternative narratives of motherhood and reproduction mean when eventually I will have to deal with these sorts of things and uh, can caring for my cancer also exist within the space of motherhood and mothering sort of an other in a sense. Um, and uh, tying it in in the part two of this series in a way, um, I would like to bring back in my both my mother and my sister's experience to sort of re-articulate how this device could be used to bridge these connections and maybe smooth over some of this friction. My, my sister is also an artist and has made art around this and my mother is really into crafts. And so I would like to include their aesthetics into a new device for um, this Mother's Becoming exhibition, as well as a dialogue with my mother about these sorts of experiences and sort of inherited um, uh, trauma and anxiety uh, from this genetic diagnosis. And then hopefully in part three, I will, uh, I'm working on trying to find a way in Germany to be able to make my own cell line and activate this gene and grow my own cancer using all these things that I've kind of learned and built along the way. Um, and that is the end of my talk. Thank you a lot. That, that was amazing. I don't even know what can I say. You know, when you go to stand up and you get top off the top of <laughs> that's how you felt like every one of your projects is amazing and the meaning behind them. Thank you. Thank you. No, I really appreciate it. That means so much. Hope oh, you already have comments in the chat. So Brian says, thank you, Lindsay. I think your work is bloody amazing. Thank you. <laughs> he also has a question. Uh, do you think the levels of your of humor in your work affect the audience, uh, how the audience react to your work, specifically with the ethical and important questions to the work generates? Um, yeah, that's a good question. I personally really like humor um, as a narrative device. I think oftentimes when we think about these ethical questions, it's often so serious and so um, undigestible in a way, especially with the general public that uh, humor really is is a wonderful way to like both 
make it more digestible and also create more of like an uncomfortable and an ease about it because you're enjoying it in a way, but you're, you feel like you shouldn't enjoy it. Um, uh, as well as oftentimes when I'm coming up with ideas, I, I, once again, I do just tell my mother them as a joke and then, or like I'll drunk text to friends, a lot of them as a joke and I'll eventually just be like, no, wait, that was a good idea. I need to go back to that. There was something of substance there. So I think uh, humor really uh, as a part of my practice is important um, as well as my aesthetic positioning. However, I have been uh, a lot of times when people do get uh, feel upset by my work, it does come from the place of it being humor, which I think is really interesting um, in a way. And so I, I think that sort of speaks to the more the, the power of humor and how uh, it really does, yeah, it both makes you more comfortable but unsettles you at the same time. And I think people are more reactive to that than I they maybe would be if I was 100% serious about everything. Um. Thank you. Oh, uh, I have questions. Oh, Rina has a question first. Yeah, you can go, Rina. No? Oh, hey, do you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't get my video on, but thank you very, very, very much. It was super interesting. Like so many different directions that you are taking and like everything seems so pro. Like I was just amazed. And uh, what I was thinking was that, have you like uh, discovered or developed some kind of like a theoretical account for for these ethical ethical questions? that sometimes like maybe, as you said, might haunt this work of yours, which is so beautiful. Like if people are asking like, well, how, how can you use these tissues and stuff like that? Is it okay for them, uh, you know? So I was just thinking, cause there's so many interesting theoretical accounts that you could rely on somehow or some arguments. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm a little bit sick, so. It's difficult to speak now, but yeah, I'm just like getting some ideas that what kind of like uh, arguments you could be using, or do you have have you developed some kind of like arguments for these ethical questions? Yeah, for sure. No, that's a great question. Um, I think I was very, I've been very lucky in the fact that um, during my master's degree, I got to study under um, Oran Katz and Yonat Zer, who are the tissue culture artists, like. Um, originators in a way they they were some of the first people doing it and have done some of the most amazing projects with it and um i've really fallen back on sort of uh their framework for things they did projects like uh victimless leather where they created like a, a living sweater made from my cells that was at the moma and uh i think during one of the exhibitions paula antonelli asked, like she had to kill the artwork and it became a big scandal in the new york times as well and they were the sort of the originators of the idea of uh, growing meat in the lab for consumption. Um, so their ethical framework has definitely played a huge role in how I frame my work, especially within the role of like, uh, as an artist, why can I do this? What gives me the right to do this? And I think artistic research is valid and equally as valid as like scientific research is really important and stuff, but I don't think people should sort of push away artistic research. I think artistic research is very valid and very important. Um, I oftentimes use my, my breast cancer project as an example of that because scientists really can't look at this in the same way that I can or study how this impacts patient identity. And sociologists do lots of things on qualitative data and gathering things, but also these personal narratives that that I put out are so important in relating to that. And um, sociologists really do love, I love having conversations and I think they love having conversations with me about that because I get to give them this narrative that then they can kind of interact with as well in their own research. Um, uh, outside of when a lot of people just get upset with me about using stem cells and killing them in the gallery, I explain how often and how regular they're killed in the laboratory and how maybe they like, uh, I'm highlighting something that maybe they didn't know about before and uh, more of like a problem that exists in a more larger capacity. Should, should science be doing this as well? Um, uh, and like, how should science be doing this? I think those are very good questions to be asking. Um, and 
uh, yeah, in terms of a lot of the ethical work or sort of the work that I do, it doesn't exist within outside the ethical capacity of what can be done in the laboratory. And oftentimes I am applying for ethics applications within the university itself in order to do the work and get it approved and things like that. Um, which is something I, I'm an art professor here at Idmo University and something I'd end up teaching my students uh, a lot about is how you deal with that ethics applications and how do you pose ethical questions. Um, yeah, and but these are also things that I'm still working on kind of trying to think over, especially in terms of uh, how do we care for things and how do we care for artwork ethically and like how do we showcase that? I think those are questions that I'll never like find a good way of uh, working with and will always continue to be grappling uh, with these sort of uncomfortable aspects of it. Um, I hope that answers your yeah, question. That yeah. was really rambly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Like it's ongoing process, of course. And this is what I wanted to hear. Like, how do you approach that? And yeah, I really relate to this. And thank you for your answer. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for the question. <laughs> so, so one more question in the chat. Um, the chat. <laughs> uh, from Dyson, he says, you mentioned you work in many different locations and in different conditions. What does the studio mean to you? That's a really good question. Someone was actually asking me about the other day because they're like, you must have a normal studio, right? And I was like, no, no, I don't. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's like one of the, the benefits and also like the, the problems of working in both like the laboratory spaces where I work in the physical world and also when I'm doing digital art, uh, it's completely online, especially because my collaborator just lives in Australia and I don't live in Australia anymore, unfortunately, to be with them. Um, so I think there's a wonderful part of where the studio can be kind of wherever I am or where I get permission to be. Um, uh, but also I'm quite envious of other artists and their studios. I actually did a studio visit the other day of someone who had a bunch of plants and it seemed wonderful to just have a space where you could throw all your things because I definitely collect lots of things and I have nowhere to put them. Um, yeah, I think I, I think I am continually redefining what a studio means, and maybe one day I'll have more of a of a uh, concrete idea about where my studio is. Thank you, thank you a lot. Uh, are there any other questions for Lindsay? Because I have a few questions, but you already answered them. So. <laughs> There's another comment from Rena. Would be amazing to get a tower reading too. <laughs> ah, yeah, we wanna, both me and Jess wanna hold another uh, session soon. We need to find the right sort of platform to do it at. Um, we really like doing them. They're quite fun and intimate. And it's really nice to have those one-on-one -on -one experiences with an audience. Cause I, I feel like as an artist, when you perform, it's always to like a big audience versus just like one person. Um, yeah. So I will, if you follow our account, uh, we will definitely post the next time we get an opportunity to do that um, with the registration and all of that. Um, we're very keen on having more sessions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Are there any other questions? No comments or no? Okay. <laughs> uh, Thank you again for doing the talk. Yeah, it was it was yeah. really amazing to find out about your practice. And I'm really curious what you're doing next because you told us you're working on a few projects, and I hope it goes well. Please let us. Yeah, know. We'll me too. You. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's always it's always going to be uh, it'll be an adventure. So I definitely <laughs> would love to keep you posted. Um, I'm excited to actually see what comes out of this as well. What's my last question? Do you know your chicken? <laughs> hmm. You know your chicken. My chicken. Yeah, I, that, I've been thinking about that even more since being in Russia. Can I trust them? Um, especially trying to find a good grocery store here and trying to translate everything with my phone. <laughs> I love that. So Good should thing. we wrap it up then? Yeah. yeah. If you have any feedback for us or anything you want to tell us, Please feel free to email us. Um, 
and we're looking forward to see what you're doing next. Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you everyone who came out tonight. Thank you everyone for coming. I'll see you next time.